Detect early, treat timely, eradicate totally. A global cancer awareness drive by Grace Cancer Foundation. You gotta hit cancer, a big blow. It's time to wipe off this floor. Let's run now and show. Let's get set and go. Detect early, treat timely, eradicate totally. A global cancer awareness drive by Grace Cancer Foundation. You gotta hit cancer, a big blow. It's time to wipe off this floor. Let's run now and show. Let's get set and go. जिस तूफान का डर है हर दिल में उस कैंसर को जड़ से मिटा दे हम मिलके चलो लड़ते हैं चलो पढ़ते हैं चलो दौड़ते हैं Let's run together चलो दौड़ते हैं Fight against cancer चलो दौड़ते हैं Let's run together चलो दौड़ते हैं Detect early, treat timely, eradicate totally. A global cancer awareness drive by Grace Cancer Foundation. This program starts now. Hello and welcome everyone to this webinar. We've been having webinars every Sunday evening India time. And this is a, a run up to the Grace Cancer Run on the 10th of October, Saturday. And every, every Sunday evening, we've been having these very, very informative webinars. 
as usual this sunday we have a panel of experts it's a wonder that these people so busy have found time and the only reason they found time is because they're so eager to share valuable knowledge that would be useful to us in our fight against cancer friends if you think that the medical fraternity has been overwhelmed by the covid pandemic you may be partly right but it's not entirely right because as we've been reminding you in these webinars that uh, we do not need to have a single minded focus and neglect the other deadly diseases that are uh, coming our way and have no let up even during the time of covid so we have been continuously reminding that we should not stop our treatment in cancer we should continue our treatment in cancer and today by saying shifting gears in cancer treatment what we are going to really see we've got a, a panel of experts great doctors with a wealth of experience and they're here to tell us what is latest in cancer treatment and i'm sure that's something that is so useful for us to know if or if you're not a patient this is very very useful information to you i want to quickly introduce the doctors uh, to you we have dr ishwar ishwar chandra renowned radiologist is a chief radiologist at virinchi hospitals welcome to the show dr ishwar we have dr chinna babu sunkavali robotic surgical oncologist at apollo apollo cancer institute and the founder and ceo of grace cancer foundation we have dr vijay anand reddy chief clinical oncologist and director of apollo cancer institute and we have dr sendal chief medical oncologist of indo american cancer institute so we're go first going to give each one of them some time to share and uh, actually each one of them are very busy even on a sunday i just came to know and uh, it's so gracious of them uh, to be here and to share their knowledge we're going to start with radiology you know as i have introduced dr ishwar renowned radiologist chief radiologist at uh, virinchi hospitals we will start with you and request you to share a little bit about what's going on in the world of cancer treatment we're so eager to hear from you dr ishwar chandra good evening all of you good evening to all the co-panelists and all those who are logged in live on facebook and other social media it's a pleasure to be part of this program today evening uh, can i have the can uh, powerpoint be shared please Yeah, can you make it into a screen more? Yeah, what I'll be doing is uh, uh, I'll be covering a few recent advances in the radiological diagnosis of cancer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the two cornerstones of cancer diagnosis uh, after a physical exam conducted by the doctor. or sometimes in breast cancer uh, some patients themselves do a self breast examination and then uh, they find a lump and then they report to the doctor the, the two cornerstones of diagnosis include uh, radiology which includes the various x rays the type of scans uh, uh, mammogram ct mri and pet ct and of course the final thing is a biopsy which is done most of the time sometimes in image guidance or sometimes by the surgeon himself which finally establishes the diagnosis of cancer now there are uh, five common modalities which are used in radiology for the diagnosis of cancer uh, starting from the basic conventional x rays to ultrasound scans to the ct scan mri scan and the latest advance uh, and addition to the armamentarium is the pet or the pet ct examination which most of you must be aware of or at least heard of in the common uh, media now this this all started in 1895 you all must have heard about william conrad ronchen uh, who discovered x rays uh, serendipitously it was not it was not uh, doing an experiment to detect x rays but by chance he came upon them and he diagnosed and called them as x rays because they were mysterious at that point of time and this is the first radiograph ever obtained uh, which was of his wife uh, with a ring uh, showing that so from that uh, uh, time period of time 
uh, or 100 years uh, later, uh, evolved from a conventional X-rays to currently uh, we are in the era of digital X-rays where we use digital panel detectors instead of a conventional film in the X-ray. And uh, this gives us instantaneous results. Immediately within a few seconds, uh, the X-ray is on the computer screen, which can be shared, which can be printed, which can be archived and so on with a high resolution as compared to uh, say a decade or two decades back. X-rays are not uh, predominantly used uh, in most instances of cancer diagnosis, maybe except for a screening in lung cancer, especially in high risk populations such as chronic smokers or as an occupational hazard, say somebody working in a coal mine or uh, who works with asbestos or a cement industry who are, have a predisposition or propensity to develop cancers. However, in bone cancer, uh, even today, X-ray forms a major uh, role in terms of diagnosing the bone cancer. Now, the advantages of X-ray would be it's a relatively cheap modality, it's readily available, it's a point of care technology it can be taken in mobile vans to the rural uh, areas or underserved areas, and it can be done at the bedside uh, and in so many camps, numerous camps all over the country. However, the disadvantages would include it's a low sensitivity and a low accuracy to detect cancers. Cancers need to obtain a huge size to be detectable and not all cancers uh, can be detected on, on an X-ray. And of course, there's an issue of radiation, especially when you're dealing with children and uh, uh, females, uh, especially in the pregnant age group. Now, there's a specialized X-ray study called as the mammogram, uh, which uh, studies for breast cancer. Uh, it's widely used in the West, though not uh, of uh, great significance or great uh, availability in India for screening uh, for the general population. Whereas in the West and uh, almost all the patients over the age of 40 get an annual uh, screening breast exam to detect cancer early. However, uh, in India, we usually use it for the high risk groups like a BRCA positive, where there's a genetic predisposition in the family or there's a family history, the mother develops cancer or the siblings uh, develop cancer. So we tend to use it as a screening mammogram, a screening study to detect early cancer so that uh, the life expectancy and the morbidity can be reduced. It can also be done in symptomatic is like patient coming with a breast lump or uh, discharge from the breast or there's a bloody discharge. So uh, evolved from a conventional 2D mammography, which is a uh, 2D uh, structure, a 2D depiction of a 3D structure. And uh, we have evolved into a digital breast chromosynthesis wherein we obtain multiple sections of the breast so that a thin, a small cancer like this can be depicted. If this is a 2D mammogram where this dense breast, you'll not be able to see the cancer, which appears white. Whereas if you take multiple sections like this, you could see a small cancer in the same patient with a, uh, a breast cancer here. And this is the conventional I think we have lost, due to network issues, we have lost Dr. Ishwar Chandra at a very, um, I mean, critical time in the presentation. We are working to get him back. So in, at the moment, can we move to you, uh, Dr. Chinababu, and we'll come back to Dr. Ishwar Chandra. Ah, he's back, he's back. Dr. Ishwar, if you can kindly just unmute yourself. Yeah. We lost you. Yeah. We heard about uh, the you benefits of 3D. And uh, you're talking about the mammogram. And so you can kindly continue. Thank you for coming back. Yeah. Yes. The next uh, modality is a CT scan. Could you advance it forward? Yeah. The next modality is an ultrasound, which uh, generates images using, using uh, ultrasound waves. It's ideal for neck, abdomen, and soft tissues of the extremities. 
The advantage is being it's cheap, widely available. Again, it's a point of care technology which can be used in mobile vans. There's no radiation. It's safe in children and pregnancy. And it's a point of care technology. And you also use it to guide for bi obtaining biopsies from the tissue. So there's a multiple swellings in the neck in a patient who has a cancer called as a lymphoma. And there's an abdomen uh, scan which shows these multiple uh, small nodules in the liver to the extensive spread of a cancer from the stomach. However, the disadvantages would include its uh, low accuracy in obese patients and it's uh, entirely operator dependent. So if the operator is good, you tend to have good results and the operator is of uh, average thing, the results would be poor from that. The next widely uh, used modality is a CT scan, wherein we obtain multiple slices of, of the region of interest. And currently we have a 3D technique where we obtain large amount of data and reconstruct it so that you can get a 3D uh, exact map of the uh, entire organ as well as the cancer. The first scanner is, uh, was made available in 1971. It's ideal for most organs in the body. And now we started with a one slice, maybe in 90s. Now we have uh, scanners which, are, which can obtain uh, up to 320 slices in a single rotation and the whole body can be obtained in less than a minute. That's the power of uh, the computers, what we have, and the power of hardware we have. Uh, the advantages would include its high resolution images. We can have 3D images. We can have low dose scans for lung cancer screening, especially what we have in the high risk populations like chronic smokers. However, the disadvantages would include it's a radiation modality. It involves ionizing radiation. We need to give IV contrast, which is a medicine, so that cancers can be picked up better and it's relatively expensive. Now, MRI utilizes the principles of magnetism, utilizing radio frequency waves. It's a recent technique, maybe in the 1980s, it's become popular in India. It came in around 1990s. It's ideal for most organs in the body, except for lungs and bowel. Now we have uh, magnetic strengths ranging from one point for Tesla to three Tesla. Currently, most of the hospitals and diagnostic centers are migrating from one point five to three Tesla so that you can get better depiction of tumors and a better depiction of organs. And seven Tesla uh, machines are also available in the West, though not in uh, India at this moment, which would even uh, further increase the accuracy of diagnosis. So it's a, as I've said, it's a not, uh, it doesn't involve radiation. So it's very safe in children and pregnancy and you can obtain whole body scan. So there's a large tumor in the brain, which is called as a glioblastoma, extremely aggressive tumor. And there's a large tumor in the shoulder joint in a child, again, an extremely aggressive tumor called as Ewing sarcoma. The disadvantage would be it's an expensive modality. It's limited availability. We don't have as many scanners as uh, our population would require. Claustrophobia, some people can't uh, get a scan done because of uh, uh, the limitations of the space which uh, is there in the magnet. Pacemakers and cochlear implants, again, they will not be able to uh, get a scan because it interferes with their uh, function. Now, the last modality which has made a dramatic uh, advance uh, or uh, in treatment as well as diagnosis, especially in staging of cancers, is called as a PET. Or it's usually combined with a CT scan, so it's called as a PET CT. So it, it involves principles of nuclear medicine, uh, isotopes and uh, positrons. It's a relatively recent technique. Uh, 1990s, the world has seen that. In India, it came in early 2000s. The beauty of this is it's a both an anatomical technique. The CT provides anatomy like this. It's, and the PET image shows the functional. Only tumors which are active, which are proliferating, will show the uptake like this. This is a neck cancer here, which has spread locally into the lymph nodes of the neck. And you could fuse these images so that you can have the best resolution of the anatomical imaging like the CT and the poor uh, uh, resolution with the higher functional status of PET combining so that you tend to know the exact status and location of the tumor. So there are different traces for different cancers and uh, we have high resolution CT images from the CT combined with the low resolution from the PET giving a fusion image. Uh, excellent modality for staging of cancers, to evaluate treatment responses and it's a whole body imaging in, uh, image from head to toe in less than a half yeah. hour of time. The limitations would be it's an expensive uh, modality. It's compared to all of the previously said modalities. It's limited availability. It's not yet available in the districts. It's mostly confined to cities. Uh, radiation is an issue. Both CT and PET have an issue of radiation and you need to give IV uh, contrast. So there are, so we started off with a tracer called as a FDG, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, 18 FDG isotope. 
Now we have moved on to special uh, tracers for specific cancers. The most widely used for uh, neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas or elsewhere is called as a gallium dota pet. And uh, we also have uh, a fluoride pet for bone cancer, which has spread to the body, uh, to the various bones. You could use these specific tracers for specific cancers. And radiology, other than detection, we also use it for as a guidance for biopsy. For tumors which are deeply seated, you use under CT guidance to put a needle, obtain tissue for uh, biopsy, and you also plan for various types of uh, minimally invasive treatments. So MRI, CT, and PET are whole body images. You can get uh, wonderful images like this. Uh, and these are the various modalities in use as of today. Uh, I thank uh, the Grace Cancer Foundation and all the co-panelists for this time. Thank you. Dr. Ishwar, thank you very much. When uh, your network uh, came in, the network issue came in, I got personally disappointed because it was so thorough. But thank you so much for immediately uh, coming back. There is a question that has come, which may be relevant to uh, take right now. And uh, even before mentioning the question, I just want to thank you because you gave such a wonderful perspective even in terms of what uh, screening um, is, uh, screening methodology is available in the districts, in the cities, and even internationally. That was a good uh, perspective, and it, it uh, talks about the, uh, the breadth and the depth of your knowledge. The question is very specifically about PET. Um, so, um, uh, and this is probably uh, from a patient who wants uh, that guidance, because we seem to know that it is, uh, a recent and a very comprehensive and probably the best uh, available. If you can give a perspective, if you have to take uh, a scan, which would you go for for screening? Uh, would would you go in for PET immediately, or what? How how would you place it? No, uh, for screening purposes, PET is not the modality. PET or PET CT, number okay. one. Number two, it's basically once you diagnose the cancer then the physician orders for a PET CT to look for the staging in what all places it has gone so that he can plan appropriate treatment. Number two, the screening or the radiology test depends upon the place where the cancer arises. Suppose for a solid organ, you tend to do a PET CT, but for tumors for the blood or the bone marrow, neither of these radiology modalities uh, are required. It's just a simple blood example. Say, for example, for leukemias, so radiology is not uh, necessary at all, except for complications. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ishwar, for busting my own ignorance uh, here. And uh, so it, it was very clear. So it's not a screen. It's PET is not for screening. Yes. It is for staging. Uh, yes. Thing. So thank, thank you very much for that clarity. We'll move on. We have uh, this experts here. As I was telling you, they're renowned experts in their respective uh, specializations in the country and even with international plaudits. So we have Dr. Chinababu with us. Uh, so we'll move to surgical oncology. He's a robotic surgical oncologist at uh, Apollo Cancer Institute. He's also also the founder and CEO of Grace Cancer Foundation, which organizes the Grace Cancer Run. Without much ado, over to you, Dr. Chinababu. What's latest in the field of surgical oncology? Uh, thank you so much, Pramod, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, I'm grateful to my co-panelists uh, who have really given their time for this uh, important uh, program that we are doing to drive the awareness for cancer. So if I can have the slides, please, I would uh, straight away go into the topic that is given to me. How are we shifting gears in cancer care? So, especially with respect to the surgical oncology. Niranjan? So, a lot of advances have taken place, just like in uh, imaging for radio, you know, for the diagnosis of cancer in surgical oncology as well. We have uh, significant advances that have come up, uh, right from the uh, management of the cancers of the head and neck to the management of the tumors of the breast, maybe, you know, limb salvage for uh, the uh, tumors in the, uh, you know, periphery. So, definitely, it is a long way that we have come from where we were and where we are today. So if you look back, we were doing more radical surgeries before. Now, these days, though they're less radical, but they're adequate, we were doing more open surgeries before. But today, we do a lot of minimally invasive surgeries. When I say minimally invasive, it is laparoscopic or robotic surgeries. We were doing uh, many cases before were inoperable. But today, you know, we can give a new adjuvant, I mean, the chemotherapy or the radiation my other colleagues would be sharing. So you give them upfront and then make them eligible for surgery. So we were doing a thorough lymph node clearance before for 
uh, most of the cancers irrespective of the stage, but from there on, we have moved on to something called as sentinel node biopsy, which is the first landing node. We sample that. If that is positive, we do the lymph node clearance. Otherwise, we don't have to do an unnecessary clearance. For example, breast cancer, we were doing a radical mastectomy, which was called as, you know, one of the most grotesque surgeries in the good old days. The entire breast, the chest wall, muscles, everything was removed. But from there on, we have moved on to something called the breast conservative surgery, wherein we do only the lumpectomy, and if need be, do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, and then do the axillary clearance if need be. So that's what we are trying to avoid the morbidity to the patient, at the same time trying to give the best outcomes to the patient in terms of the minimally invasiveness of the, the surgical nature. So similarly, what has that really helped us reach here? So we, have, we know the disease behavior better. We know the, uh, the progression of the disease much better. We know what is sufficient now because we have enough data, enough uh, the randomly controlled trials have given us some insights. Advances in technology like laparoscopy and robotics, advances in diagnostics, we have heard about the role of MRI, PET CT scan, and uh, of course, there is a significant uh, movement uh, in terms of the chemotherapy and the radiation that they're giving today. So today, we are looking at avoiding unnecessary radical procedures, for example, for oral cavity cancers. Good old days, we were knocking off the entire mandible, and you know we were giving so much of uh, grotesque appearance, what is called as, uh, you know, Andy Gump deformity, a famous cartoon called Andy Gump, wherein the whole mandible is not there, chin is not there. So from there on, we have moved on to very good reconstructive techniques, less invasive surgeries, but yet we're able to give a better survival and outcome to the patient. So we have moved on to robotic surgery these days, even in cancer care. So that's what is very important. Why rob robotics? Though I don't believe in the theory of evolution, but definitely in terms of the um, cancer care, we have moved towards a lot of uh, advances in terms of robotics into the uh, surgical oncology. So uh, what is a robot and what is a robotic surgery? So the robot would not to the patient and say that it will do the surgery. Ultimately, it is your surgeon who will be operating, but we are using a computer interface in the operating room. So it is just a technology interface, but the surgeon will be the same. We are just using better equipment for better care of the patient. So this is how the, uh, the robotic uh, OR looks like. The surgeon sits at the surgeon's console. Uh, he has got a master slave control. You have a 3D vision there. You have a screen available there. You put your head into it. You will be able to see the entire abdomen or the cavity. And then uh, instruments are placed. So you're sitting remote from the patient. You can do a telesurgery. You can be, you know, you can be seated anywhere else. And then you can perform this uh, surgery. In the days to come, we are looking at a telesurgery coming up in a big way. So this is what is the robotic, uh, you know, the setup looks like the same instruments, the robotic arms are placed into the patient and then you go to the console and take control of the patient. So these are all some of the pictures of the, how, uh, this is how the uh, console looks like and the patient setup is like that. The robot has got four arms. So the four arms can be put into patient through small keyholes. So you don't have to open up the entire abdomen. So this is what is uh, the robotic surgery. What is the advantage is you know, just like much better than your fingers you have a fine movement of the robotic instruments. So the dexterity is much better, 10 times magnification you have, and uh, you have a 3D vision. So it's as good as open surgery, at the same time you're doing without opening. So in that sense, it's just like the fine movements, the finger tremors are eliminated and you're able to do a much precise work, a bloodless field is created for you and you have a magnified view. So this is just a small picture how your movements are the surgeon's console uh, gets into the movement in the patient. So we're trying to do uh, join the two parts of small intestine. So the movements of the surgeon or the master slave control is what is the movement of the robotic instruments of the arms in the patient. So this is, you are not under the patient, but you're able to do this surgery re remotely. So this is a very precise and more accurate way of doing, and we are moving towards a digital surgery these days. So that is the advancement that I can see the shifting gears in Surgical oncology is more in terms of laparoscopy and robotic surgery. So enough evidence is there. I will not go into that. We used to do such major open surgeries. Now today, we can do even the oral cancer surgery with the robot without opening up. Even for thyroid surgery, we can do a robotic uh, surgery without a scar in the neck, especially for select young women who do not want to have a scar in the neck, we can do a robotic surgery. So this is the big scar for thyroid surgery, but this can, this, this can be avoided and you can do a robotic surgery without a scar in the neck. So that is the beauty, that the advantage that you have. So whatever the laparoscopy did not deliver to us, all that can be delivered with robotic surgery. So the hand movement is much more precise. You have the wrist movement is much better in robotic compared to laparoscopy. You see much better. You see they're doing a fine dissection in the most crucial areas, looking at the anatomy very, very clearly and doing the best lymph node clearance 
or the disease clearance. So that's how the robotics is uh, definitely the way forward. We look at uh, the paradigm shift is there in terms of the surgical thinking. We moved on from open to laparoscopy to robotic surgery, from bigger incision to smaller incisions, minimally invasive surgery, the order of the day for most of the cancers. We have better outcomes today. We, have, we are looking at organ preservation strategy instead of knocking off all the organs and yet we are able to reduce the morbidity, improve the quality of life of the patient and we look at the dental surgery as the future. And technology is here to say with that, I would like to sum up and thank each one of you for your patient hearing. Thank you, Pramod. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chinambabu. I hope you can hear me. That was excellent. clear as to what robotic surgery is. There is one question we would like to quickly pose to you. And I mean, even before you go into robotic surgery as opposed to surgery, um, the, the question that has come in is, and this is a dilemma that many cancer patients uh, face. So we want your perspective as when do we go in for surgery? I mean, um, uh, what what are the parameters that we used to decide? Do we go in for surgery or do, do we go in for non-surgical treatment? Uh, yeah. If you can just uh, throw some light on that. Sure. Thanks, uh, Pramod, for that question. I think uh, the modality of treatment depends upon the stage of the disease and the site of the disease. So for most of the solid tumors, early stage, you go for surgery first. But again, it also depends upon the site. So for some, for example, for larynx throat, throat cancer, even if it's early stage, we go for radiotherapy first. So it all it is a multidisciplinary approach. We have a tumor board discussion. We have the medical oncologist. We have a radiation oncologist. We discuss all the modalities within the group and then give the perfect plan for the patient. So no single blanket therapy that can be advocated. But in general, for solid tumors, early stages surgery is usually the first option. Hope that answers and uh, my other colleagues would uh, definitely answer uh, the role of uh, the medical oncologist and the radiation oncologist also would come into the picture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chinababu, for immediately answering this question. Friends, uh, we'll move on. We have a very senior and uh, respected uh, uh, oncologist, you know, as the chief clinical oncologist and director of Apollo Cancer Institute. I'm talking of uh, Dr. Vijayanand Reddy. And uh, he's also served as a consultant ocular oncologist at LV Prasad. There are plenty of plaudits here. He's founded the Cure Foundation. It's for the poor. They can avail the best of cancer care through this. And he served in as member and um, leadership capacity in numerous prestigious committees and bodies, including American Society of Clinical Oncology, American Society of Radiation Oncologists, um, Union of International Cancer Control, European Society of Medical Oncology. It's plenty, but uh, over to you, Dr. Vijayanand. I know you have come in from another panel, and that's so gracious of you to make time to share with the, the viewers here. Over to you, Dr. Vijayanand. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pramod, for the kind introduction. Uh, I have a few slides which I wanted to show because uh, the audience would uh, be easy for them to understand what I'm saying. Can you share my slides, uh, Mr. Niranjan? All right. Right, may I go on to the first slide? Can we move? Can you make it here? Yeah. Thank you very much. So, so basically what we are talking about, uh, Dr. Chinna has mentioned about multimodality treatment. Uh, so, so next slide, next slide, please. All right, I'm not able to move the slides. All right, can I? Can I move the slides, please? or move it by yourself. Mr. Niranjan, make it second one, please. It's stuck. Mm -hmm. Can you go on to the next slide, please? It's not moving. Anyway, if you're not we'll able to- We'll work on that, uh, Dr. Vijayan. I right, think he's so just uh, sharing and unsharing. 
uh, right. but uh, yeah let, let me go ahead so we should all understand that the cancer is going to be a dreadful disease and it is increasing uh, as we say covid pandemic but actually cancer is spreading like a pandemic across the globe the incidence of cancer is unfortunately going up and up and in india we see around uh, 12 uh, lakh cases every year uh, that's quite scary now it's moving on to 15 lakh cases per year so the burden is increasing and you see one in every 10 patients that we see uh, are going to get affected with cancer but the good news is that the cancer can be prevented can be detected early and also can be treated appropriately if you look at the the cure rates presently are much 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 higher compared to uh, the cure rates in the past so around two thirds of the cancer what we see in and out Uh, we are able to treat cancer that's mainly because of better understanding of uh, the disease uh, um, uh, team work it's a multi modality team approach wherever it is required you look at uh, uh, surgery uh, radiation or chemotherapy so if you work as a team and if you decide on the the best possible modality of treatment then the results would certainly be uh, better and better as far as the radiation oncology is concerned uh, basically the cancer is treated mainly by surgery radiation and chemotherapy so basically if you go to the radiation oncology uh, radiation used to be a very very uh, tough for treatment for the patients in the past uh, it is to they used to get burnt out the skin used to get burnt out and the normal structures in the body used to get affected uh, with the kind of radiation that was available in the past unfortunately uh, that was the past but fortunately if you look at the radiations have mainly moved from uh, uh, a, a source of radiation like cobalt to a completely electronically controlled uh, x ray uh, treatments which is called linear accelerators so these linear accelerators have really changed because you know the computers can be controlled uh, efficiently by various uh, uh, gadgets so we have the latest uh, machines uh, that are available which can precisely treat uh, the tumor uh, with the least uh, dose to the normal structures so if you look at uh, uh, the newer technologies we call it as imrt igrt new new names so that you probably might be hearing now and then but the real revolution happened with the advent of uh, the radiation being modulated when you do a, a, a dose of radiation to an area and if you can modulate within that area low dose and high dose and no dose then you have achieved the what you wanted that means you are reducing the dose to the target and you are increasing the dose to the uh, tumor which you want to deliver so that is what is called intensity of radiation being modulated if you look at uh, the uh, the head and neck area which is shown in this slide a small area of tumor can be treated with high dose and various areas in that head and neck areas can be dose painted and see this area i need high dose and this area i do not need any kind of radiation so that is kind of uh, technique these these days that is available uh, then we are able to deliver safely high dose of radiation in these areas and a low dose of radiation in other areas whichever in fact we can dictate with which areas require what kind of radiation not only that we are able to precisely see uh, and precisely look before the patient gets the radiation when the patient is lying down on the couch so the innovations are going on and on and recently we got a new technology called tomotherapy where you can on a single sitting a patient uh, uh, moves from in and out and from head to toe we can deliver radiation to the brain lung and uh, liver and different sites in one single go so that is called tomotherapy now you might have heard about the proton therapy the proton therapy is a particle radiation where what is the difference between the linear accelerator and proton therapy we we'll just move it up a little bit yeah so this proton therapy the advantage of proton therapy is that the radiation wherever you want to stop you can stop the radiation there so that is the greatest advantage of proton therapy especially when you are treating children the when you are treating the spine the anterior part the entire visceral organs can be completely spared from there we moved on to the latest treatment called stereotactic radio surgery that means that when you do a radiation normally you do it for 5 to 6 weeks but in this stereotactic radiation we are able to deliver 
high dose of radiation in one or three days. That means if you look at the lesion in the brain like this, and you deliver in three days time, and you see the disappearance of the tumor. So that is the kind of uh, uh, radiation that is available these days that is called stereotactic radiation. So there you have a lesion in the lung, you have lesion in the brain, wherever it is, instead of giving it for six weeks, you're able to deliver in three days. That's called stereotactic radiation. So you name it, you have it, that is because of the computer technology, we're able to precisely target the, uh, target the lesion which you want to deliver and burn without causing problems to the patient. So you need to know the man behind the screen is very, very important. As Dr. Chinna mentioned, robotic surgery does not mean the robotic would come and operate. So when you do this kind of radiation, radiation oncologist's role is of immense importance that he has to target, delineate the tumor precisely and plan the radiation in such a way that high dose of radiation is given to the target and minimal or no dose radiation to the the, uh, the normal structures. So their attitude has to be good. The goals of the treatment are not only just the survival, but you have precisely uh, uh, preserved the organ and function and minimize the morbidity wherever possible. That is the goal of treatment these days with uh, radiation uh, treatment. Can I have the next slide, please? This is not going to move. So it's better that we... So from so in uh, in other words, unless we fall, we we uh, play the uh, team's role. Uh, whenever you are treating a patient, uh, then we can't achieve a proper goal that what we were aiming at. So it's a multi-modality approach where a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, surgical oncologist uh, sit together and discuss a patient and see what could be the best modality of treatment in that particular patient to get the best outcome. So that's the way forward, and that's the way that you need to treat a cancer patient. Nobody is important. Everybody is important. It's like that. It's a team approach. Then only you get the best outcome. Thank you very, very much. This is just to say the multimodal treatment is required. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Pramod. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vijayanand. I mean, as director of Apollo Cancer Institute, how apt it is that you're talking about the team approach. That is very reassuring to the patients to know that even in the age of specialization, we have these uh, uh, different illusions that it's highly specialized, but you brought in that team aspect there. Thank you so much. There's one uh, very specific question, Dr. Vijayanand. Uh, you touched upon it, but a little more information we would like to know about the proton therapy. Um, you mentioned it as something very, um, I mean, you mentioned it in your talk, if you can kindly give us a little more information. Right. So normally what we used to do is the X-ray treatment. It's a glorified X-ray machine is a linear accelerator. That is controlled very precisely and delivered radiation to the deep-seated tumors anywhere in the body. So beyond that, what we recently got is a proton, is a particle radiation where you deliver radiation to a deep-seated tumor and beyond that you don't have any radiation. So the linear accelerators the uh, existing linear accelerators, radiation goes through and through the body. That means even the exit also would have certain amount of dose. Whereas a proton will go there, deep seated, and then stop there. It won't be no radiation beyond the target. So that is the difference between a photon linear accelerator versus a proton therapy. And is this available, Dr. Very Vijayan? Much in India, uh, very much in India, in Apollo, uh, we have uh, proton beam therapy. Uh, only issue is the cost. The cost is 10 times more than the linear accelerator. But certainly if one can afford, a proton would definitely reduce the uh, side effects more than the linear accelerator. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijayanand. Uh, friends, we have one more uh, very eminent uh, panel member here, uh, Dr. Sendil Rajapa. And uh, Dr. Sendil Rajapa served as consultant Apollo Hospitals, Chennai, Vijaywada, and then he joined the university teaching uh, hospital at Nizam's Institute at Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. And then he moved to, uh, you know, Indo-American Cancer Institute, where he is now uh, and uh, as a chief medical oncologist. So we are moving into medical oncology now. Uh, numerous endowment prizes, published more than 50 articles, delivered more than 150 lectures, and a uh, member of various societies, even in leadership position. We are privileged to have you uh, with us, Dr. Sendil Rajapa, and over to you. 
to enlighten us on what as a patient we would like to know about the latest in the field of medical oncology. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Pramod, for that very kind introduction and Chinna for asking me to be here this evening. Uh, we are usually talking to medical people. It's very monotonous. We are talking the same things. I'm delighted today to be talking to non-medical people. I'm sure there are some in the audience, but I'm really delighted today to be in the midst of non-medical people. And the reason is, though we talk about our own specialities, they spring up with such lovely questions that it always sets us thinking as to what the next best thing to be done is. Uh, medical oncology is usually synonymous with chemotherapy, right? And chemotherapy is synonymous with side effects. So I think this is something that we should erase from our minds because today we are moving into precision medicine and very personalized medicine. How do we do precision medicine? Primarily because technology has helped our understanding of what the tumor is. Today we are able to sequence tumors better, look for molecular targets in tumors, and try to use drugs that will work well on that particular tumor. That means all lung cancers are not treated alike. All breast cancers are not treated alike. You need to subtype them, understand what they are better, and then decide what you want to do for that patient. As I said, it works better, but more importantly, it minimizes the physical toxicity that you can have sometimes with all of these therapies, and that includes radiation and surgery also. Let's not go home today with the impression that those therapies don't cause any side effects at all. And even more important in our country is the financial toxicity of treatment, because you don't want to use a treatment that is less likely or unlikely to work because cancer treatments can be expensive, as Dr. Vijayanand rightly pointed out. I think the second important advance that we have seen in uh, medical oncology is also personalizing. We spoke about precision. Precision is with respect to the tumor. Personalizing is with respect to the patient. You want to have patient-centered therapy. We are all super at treating diseases. But when it comes to treating patients as a whole, we sometimes fail because patients come with their own wish list. You know, you may think that a, a treatment is super, but that is not something that your patient might think. A 72-year-old with diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease might have a different view of the therapy that you're offering compared to somebody who's 40 years old. So today, treatment is more patient-centered, at least in medical oncology and, and also in the other subspecialities. Uh, the other important thing that has happened in medical therapy of cancer is something that we call as immunotherapy. What does this do? It does not directly act on the cancer. It stimulates your own immunity to fight against the cancer. Now, I'm not talking about zinc and vitamin C that people talk about in the COVID era. I'm talking about certain other highly specialized drugs, which we use today to stimulate and improve the host's immunity to fight against the cancer. And though I don't want to claim that these therapies have worked well for everybody, but at least in a fraction of patients, we see that these therapies work like wonders. And for patients who at some point in time we were thinking would live a very, very short time, now are living really for longer times. And I think that's a very, very important advance. The third important thing is supportive care. Now, I started by talking about toxicity of therapy, but now we've got some lovely drugs and gadgets to help patients have minimal or no toxicity. We've got some machines that can minimize hair loss. We've got drugs with lesser toxicity. There are some chemotherapy drugs for specific cancers which do not have hair loss. You know, there are women who would trade their life for their hair. You won't believe that it happens in day-to-day -day practice but there are certain situations where drugs can be different, these gadgets can be used. Some other important things are the support that we get from our colleagues in anesthesia. If you want to do very aggressive surgery, critical care, because if I want to do a bone marrow transplantation, I don't have a critical care team which can take care of my patients when they are sick, then I can't do this very high tech treatment which can come with some terrible complications. So. Our colleagues in other specialities, we spoke about multidisciplinary, we spoke about multimodality. 
I think these are some very, very important advances in medical management. Treatment on the whole has become safer, less side effects and better outcomes. But at the end of the day, I, I, I love to say two important things. One is the two P's that I like and the three A's. You know, the two P's are prevention and palliation. This country cannot afford the super gadgets and the super drugs that we have for every cancer patient that walks into our outpatient. So prevention is the way to go in this country. And we have to look at that very, very importantly. Palliation, helping patients go through this disease with dignity and die with dignity and not suffer the problems of this disease. Those are the two P's. We'll discuss about that later if you have questions. The three A's are attitude, which again, Dr. Vijayanand pointed out earlier, attitude of the physician, attitude of your patient, access to therapies, which is not so great even at, at a point in time when you have so many cancer institutes and so many specialists. And finally, affordability. These are the three important A's that we have which I think as we shift gears and move forward, we should be getting better. And very, very important is the multidisciplinary approach itself because there's super scientific evidence today to say that if you've got multidisciplinary care, the outcome for your cancer patient is better. So those are some of the very relevant and important issues that we have in medical oncology, which has improved life for patients and things are getting better. The future is certainly bright. I'll hand it over back to Pramod so that we'll have more time for discussion. Thanks so much, Pramod. Thanks again, Chinna. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sindhil. In uh, such a brief but power-packed, full of insights. Uh, friends, I just want to uh, just reiterate uh, what he said. I mean, the two P's and the three A's, I hope you got it. You know, prevention and palliation. And then the attitude, so important in fighting against a disease in your body, the access uh, and then the affordability. That was so empathetic of you, uh, Dr. Sendhil, to uh, talk about financial toxicity. You know, <laughs> that's a that's great uh, term. It's and, uh, you know, we think, uh, lay people here, and uh, when you were talking about speaking to non-medical persons, there's a prime person here, we think uh, that, uh, you know, um, doctors don't care about it. But you've shown, shown so much empathy when you talked about it. Dr. Vijayanand talked about it. Everyone touched upon it. So that's part of the overall uh, strategic approach. So thank you so much. Uh, just on a side note, I was so encouraged when you said that uh, even from medical oncology point of view, you're having drugs that will actually prevent hair loss, even without a trace of cancer or without going any near drugs, I'm having severe hair loss. So it was very, um, <laughs> very comforting to me. That you... <laughs> <laughs> Once lost, it's always lost. <laughs> the two questions that have come in, uh, Dr. Sindhil, if you don't mind, I'll mention both the questions yeah. and then you can. Uh... So number one is about genomic testing. How necessary is that for all tumors? And I'll mention the other one too, because you're so quick and brief in it. CAR-T therapy, is it available in India? So genomic testing and CAR-T therapy. Okay, the second is easy to answer. Second is not available yet in India. CAR-T is not yet available, but I think it will be available in the next couple of years because again, research is going on to make a CAR-T cell therapy that's affordable for our patients. If you want to go to the West and have it, I think it's some obscene sum. It's some 65 crores or something like that you have to spend. I, I don't think, uh, you know, you have to have Mukesh Ambani, not Anil Ambani. I, you know, Anil Ambani cannot afford it anymore. All right, so that's one. Uh, the first question is about genomic medicine. Great question. Uh, so genomic medicine is practiced in, in, in two aspects. Now, one is from a therapeutic standpoint. The other is from a prevention standpoint. When you come to therapeutic standpoints, there are certain cancers wherein you can sequence the genome of the cancer and then look for targets and treat it. This is not available for all cancers, but it's available for many cancers, some as standard therapies and some as therapies which are not routinely used in that cancer, but can be used. The example is that you do some sequencing, you find a gene uh, you know, that's altered, uh, routinely not altered in that cancer, but it's routinely, let's say, altered in lung cancer. And you can use that lung cancer drug for breast cancer, you know, that kind of a situation. So you're looking for targets and trying to treat. The second situation where genomic medicine is important is when you're looking for the preventive aspect. You know, uh, 
you've got a strong family history or got a special, uh, you know, a specific type of cancer, wherein the likelihood of somebody harboring a genetic abnormality that predisposes this patient to cancer is there. So that is another situation where we would like to look at certain specific genes. And if they are mutated, offer certain specific strategies for screening and prevention of cancer. So those are the two areas where genomic medicine is routinely used today in practice. Sure. Uh, Dr. Sindhil, now the questions are just pouring in. Thank you for uh, very quickly uh, mentioning it. And this question is open. Any would, anyone could answer. Dr. Vijayanand already touched upon it. But very specifically, the question is the difference between IMRT and proton therapy. If you could just throw uh, some light on this. Dr. And we could have both Dr. He, Sindhil and Dr. Vijayanand. He's the, he's the boss of radiation okay. oncology, so he will okay. take it. IMRT is uh, intensity of radiation being modulated. So that IMRT can be delivered with proton beam therapy as well. So, yeah. So IMRT is a modality of delivering the radiation to the target. That can be done with a standard photon linear accelerator. It can also be done with proton beam therapy. That is so uh, nice. Uh, Dr. Vijayanand, you have such a calm and reassuring way of, uh, uh, that's so nice to see uh, in a doctor. And uh, the, the fact that you're at the beach adds to the calmness and the uh, atmosphere of relaxation. <laughs> I know you're not. This is just a background. But uh, Dr. Chinnababu, if we can move uh, to you. I mean, a lot of talk has come. The first P that Dr. Sindhil talked about is prevention. And we know that this whole mammoth effort that you're doing about the run, the Grace Cancer Run, it's in its third year now. And it's gone international in a big way. And you're not cowed down uh, by the fact that, uh, you know, people are stuck indoors nowadays. You're still having the run. Um, could you just lead up to, I mean, what is the purpose behind this and how is it connected with the first P at least, the prevention? I think it's very well said by Dr. Senthil, prevention. So, you know, in the, we live in an era wherein majority of the cancers in this country at least are diagnosed in late stage. So now we need to move on to, at least, if not totally prevent, at least diagnose them early. So to prevent cancer, we, we know the etiology of cancer in general, it's a lifestyle disease. So it's all about our lifestyle. So one way in which we want to drive this message home strong is to create awareness, to convey the message that physical activity is also one modality in which you can reduce the risk of getting cancer. We have various studies saying the breast cancer incidence, the lung cancer incidence, the endometrial cancer incidence reduces by more than 40 to 50% with physical activity alone. So there is enough data to suggest that physical activity is you know, preventive measure. So in that sense, we have taken up this drive to not only to promote physical activity to reduce uh, the burden of cancer in society, but also to drive the awareness about cancer so that if not prevent, detect it early, and then you, know, you completely cure the disease. So that's what Dr. Vijay already showed in his first slide. So you know, prevention and then early detection and then cure. Sure. Uh, a little bit about the run, Dr. Chinnababu, if you can tell us a little bit more about that and uh, any other tips, because I am really curious. I mean, how do I do it at home? Sure. This is going to be a virtual cancer run to be held on 10th of October. So by the, when I say it's virtual, you don't have to physically come to a location. You can participate from wherever you are. You can run in a treadmill, you can run in your terrace, you can run in your backyard, in your colony, wherever you are. We'll provide you a link to join online, like the way now we are having a Facebook Live program this. Similarly, you can join online with the community running elsewhere, and then you can run, you can upload your running data into the applications available like Strava, Redmondo, or even just a few, one or two kilometers. We're not looking at a race here, but just saying you do a one kilometer a day or five days you finish or one week you finish and then you upload the data. So that's how we're trying to inculcate physical activity into our routine because in, in spite of COVID, cancer cannot be ignored. And people today, we live in a negative mode and a depressed mode. I think physical activity would certainly elevate and uh, give us long-term protection, not only uh, in terms of reducing the cancer incidence, but also from other non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, cardiac. So in that sense, this is a very... Uh, long-term strategy with which uh, Grace Foundation has started this uh, drive. 
and this is the fourth webinar uh, with the precursor. So 10th is very close by, and uh, I appeal to all the viewers to kind of spread the word and uh, make this uh, a grand success. So well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chinnababu. We'll we'll come back to you uh, towards the end. We just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, Dr. Sendhil, one more question has uh, come in. You may have covered it, but I'm really not familiar with that terminology. But uh, there's a curiosity about immune therapy. Um, and uh, so if you can just uh, throw some light on that. And the, the exact question is, is immune therapy curative for cancer? Okay, so immune therapy uh, may be curative, or I would say potentially curative for some cancers. Now, uh, when somebody comes to you with stage four cancer, you generally tell them that uh, the intent of treatment is to palliate, which means give you good quality of life and prolong your life. Now we have data now in lung cancer, in melanoma, which is a skin cancer, wherein we are now seeing that uh, one in four, or let's say one in three patients seem to be long-term survivors, which means they're potentially cured of their disease. We're seeing that they've crossed five years since the time of their diagnosis with stage four cancer. So for patients who have crossed those five years, it's very unlikely that they're going to relapse or get their disease back. So in a way, the answer is yes. So in certain situations, in certain cancers, it's potentially curative, but not in all cancers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sindhil. Um, I just want, we have a couple of minutes left, just a couple of minutes. Um, most of the questions have been covered, but I just want to know, uh, Dr. Ishwar, and uh, would, would you like to just say uh, anything to kind of wind up your thoughts? What is the one or two things you would highlight uh, from what you would like to say? Yeah, thank you, Pramod. Uh, cancer is all about primarily about prevention, uh, as Dr. Sandil has put it. But if it's not preventable, it's about early detection. And in that uh, uh, scheme of things, radiology and clinical examination and early reporting to a doctor would be in order. Uh, that's, that's my take on uh, uh, radiology aspects of uh, cancer detection and treatment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ishwar. Is there anything, Dr. Vijayanand, you'd like to say? Uh, some closing comments? Uh, just a, couple, a minute, if you can wrap up any thoughts you would like to share. Your uh, mute uh, thing. Uh, it's very yeah. common to see people saying uh, uh, pollution and uh, uh, you know the drugs, uh, the pesticides are the reasons for increasing the cancer. But uh, whatever is there in our hands, we should see that we can do something to prevent cancer and do not run away when you have some symptoms run away from getting diagnosed they are scared of cancer and then they postpone the uh, simple investigations required to detect uh, cancer early at early stage so to prevent cancer whatever that you can do it's a little bit of modifications of your lifestyle and whenever you have symptoms go to a hospital at the earliest because you can catch cancer early and the cancer cure chances would be more than 90%. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vijayana. That is uh, really uh, so reassuring, uh, both Dr. Ishwar and Dr. Vijayana. Dr. Sindhil, we still have uh, a couple of minutes, two minutes. So just re remember that the closing comments are the ones that stick in our mind the most. So anything you'd like to say? <laughs> Okay, I think uh, the attitude towards cancer patients is very, very important. I see that there's a lot of nihilism in the society. You know, that's a greater cancer than cancer itself. So it's very, very important to make sure that if somebody in your family or somebody who is near and dear to you is suffering from this disease, please take them to the hospital. There are so many things that can be done, if not to treat, at least to make them comfortable. As I said, I want to reiterate that point again and again. It's very important to live with dignity and die with dignity, right? Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be wanted and live with dignity. It's our duty and every physician, every human being is duty bound to make sure that anybody is living and dying with dignity. And let's make that a very, very important point today. So attitude is very, very important. So Absolutely. attitude to fight attitude and attitude from a doctor treating physician. We have an attitude 
to kill the cancer. So you should have attitude to fight cancer. Friends, how wonderful uh, this is. These doctors with such rich experience. I mean, uh, between all the doctors here, it's close to a century of experience, just uh, them here. And uh, they're saying about, you know, attitude. And uh, I like the word you use, Dr. Sendhil. We do have this nihilistic, you know, or insensitive or extreme nihilistic approach. We have to substitute it with an empathetic approach and, you know, uh, have a positive attitude. Thank you so much. Dr. Chinna, over uh, to you for the closing comments. Well, uh, thanks, Pramod, for being such a wonderful MC. Uh, you've been so gracious. And uh, at the outset, I'm extremely grateful to all the panelists here. Dr. Vijayanand Reddy has been uh, such a mentor and uh, such a well-wisher, not only to me, for the foundation as well. And uh, Dr. Senthil, I know how hard-pressed you are for time, but uh, you, you couldn't say no to this cause. So thank you so much. Uh, it's always for, a pleasure, uh, Chinna. Well, no, really, it means a lot. <laughs> it does mean, mean a lot. And of course, Ishwar Chandra, He's been part of the foundation in terms of uh, guiding for early diagnosis through what the campaigns that we do through mammography and uh, all those drives. He's been always there. Thank you, Dr. Ishwar Chandra, for uh, your time and uh, being always available. And uh, just I want to give a call to all the viewers. Please join us for this upcoming event on 10th of October, the virtual run. And uh, let us together make a difference. Let us fight cancer together. The attitude, I think, has been very well said by all the speakers, so, you know, I think we need, we need to have a re really a positive attitude to fight this disease. Together, we can prevent, we can reduce the burden of cancer in the society. Come join with us and uh, once again, uh, have a safe stay and uh, definitely physical activity is one means to prevent cancer. Let's embrace physical, physical activity. Let us together come and run on this historic event wherein more than 100 countries are participating. So this is the time for us to join in this historic event and uh, Drive the message of cancer awareness, as rightly said by Dr. Vijayananda and Dr. Senthil. You no know, symptoms, screening is so essential. Most of the people in our country do not go for screening. So mammography, simple pap smears. So given all this, I think definitely we have a long way to go. We, we can begin with this step of, uh, you know, adopting healthy lifestyle. So this is my appeal to all of you to please come and join in big numbers and make this a grand success. Once again, I'm really grateful to all my analysts today here. Once again, thank you, Dr. Senthil, Dr. Vijayanand, and Dr. Ishwar right. Chandra, and of course, Pramod and all the team. Thank you so much. See you next week. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chinna, and friends from these eminent doctors and wonderful human beings. They're wishing you a strong and positive attitude to fight against cancer, and they're all wishing you uh, a wonderful Grace Cancer Run on 10th October. Please register if you have not yet done it. Oh, have a good evening, each one of you. Bye-bye.